values and culture. Seems any time I talk about leadership, and I talk a lot about leadership, it always comes back to values and culture. Um, regardless of the level, regardless of the actual message that I have for, for today for leadership. Now, it comes naturally, after having spent 25 years in or around mission control, it was definitely reinforced. Um, not only our rocket science, not only our capability to do the engineering and the math, what was equally important to us in doing jobs like this and flying America's manned spacecraft was how we did it, why we did it the way we did. Very specific values, a very deliberately stewarded culture was absolutely as important to us as the rocket science, which doesn't surprise you, right? For people that have done things like this for decades, the things that we did with the spacecraft when we got into space, things that defy explanation in many cases and look like miracles. Where we're protecting people like these astronauts who are trusting us for their lives when we put them in the sky to go do work for us. How we do that job, absolutely important to us, and none of us wonder why we talk so much about the values and the culture. We get it. This job is really hard, almost impossible, and very important. And it's certainly important to these people who have trusted us with their lives. Now, where we start venturing away from that and having di have difficulty making that connection then is as we get promoted out of this room and into, ma into management. Even those of us who work in mission control, who take care of the astronauts, start losing that connection. That the reason we are perfect in that job, the reason we keep them alive and don't blow up the rocket, is absolutely that focus on our values and our culture. But when we get promoted, say in my case, the job I retired from, from NASA not long ago, Director of Mission Operations, responsible for all the mission operations for manned spaceflight. $650 million a year budget, thousands of employees, major facilities like you see here to do all of the jobs that we had on our plate. I had lots of things I had to take care of. I had business to take care of. I have other people that are managing the rocket. But I'll tell you what, leadership values, the culture of the organization, even at that level, absolutely make the difference and can make or break your people's, your people's ability at the working level to still do the right thing, to protect themselves, to protect the lives of the people who they are supposed to be taking care of, or to just get your, your, your mission done, to take care of your business. Now, to illustrate my point, I have three examples that I'll use from manned spaceflight experience. First one, January 27, 1967. That's a Saturn 1B rocket sitting on the pad on the left there with the Apollo spacecraft sitting on top of it. On the right would be the Apollo 1 astronauts suiting up and then sitting where they sat in the capsule on top of this rocket for this test, a test that was one month before we were going to launch that rocket and those astronauts into space. Five and a half hours later, a fire erupted inside the capsule. All three of those men died right where they sat. Many of you might remember that history. You might not know about the fact that the Russians had already had a similar oxygen fire. Because like us, the Russian atmosphere or the, the systems inside their capsules were also 100% oxygen, which is what drove this fire on this day. But the Russians had had a fire in an altitude chamber. And because of that fire, which by the way also killed one of their cosmonauts, they changed the atmospheric system in all of their capsules to no longer be 100% oxygen. We didn't know it happened because we're in the middle of the cold. We're, we're trying to catch the Russians, not just beat the Russians. So we weren't exchanging that kind of information. They sure as heck weren't offering it because they wanted to stay out in front of us as much as we wanted to catch up and get in front of them. Now, you might not know about this next picture, the bottom of the screen. That's the Apollo 1 astronauts and a, 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 a model of the command module. They sent this picture to the program manager. The caption said, it's not that we don't trust you, Joe, but this time we've decided to go over your head. The reason they did that, there were a host of problems with the spacecraft. In fact, their opinion, the opinion of other astronauts who had been participating in tests of that command module, all said, we can't put our finger on it, but there's something not right with this thing. It is not ready for us to fly, even though it's stacked on the pad and supposedly ready to go in a month. Gene Kranz, legendary Apollo flight director, gave a speech in mission control after this fire. And he said, we were all too gung-ho about schedule. We locked out all the problems that we had, whether it was the spacecraft or the simulator, problems in the systems at the Cape, things that we all knew about and we kept going. We have to stay on the schedule. 
not one of us raised our hand and said, damn it, we should stop. And on we went. And why were we pushing so hard? Because we have to catch and beat the Russians. But all those other problems that we had on the spacecraft and on the other systems on the ground, we fixed all of those after this fire. In fact, we, scratched, we scrapped the command module itself and we accelerated the, the, the replacement model, which fixed a whole host of other systems and safety-related problems on the spacecraft, the rocket, and the systems on the ground. All of which we would not have yet done had we not had this fire, we would have run up to launching that rocket and any of those other problems likely would have ended the same way. Fast forward 19 years later, January 28, 1986. This picture was taken on the left of Space Shuttle Challenger just after ignition, where less than a second after ignition, you see that puff of smoke in the red ellipse there on the lower right was shooting out of the side of the, so the solid rocket booster. 73 seconds later, that fire penetrated the external tank, igniting the liquid hydrogen inside. It exploded, destroying Space Shuttle Challenger. The seven astronauts you see walking out to the pad died where you see them sitting in the cockpit. Now, it was cold this day, and again, some of you might remember your NASA history, and you might remember that the reason that fire leaked out through the side of that solid rocket booster is the seals that were supposed to keep it inside were too cold. And because it was too cold, they didn't perform right, and that fire leaked out, all of which is accurate. You might not have heard that the manufacturer of the solid rocket booster, Morton Thaikal, had been recommending for days that NASA delay the launch because it was too cold. Matter of fact, their engineering team was adamant that those seals will not perform right, and they are going to leak, and they could cause something like they saw when we launched on January 28th. The Morton Thaikal executives absolutely backed them up. Engineers at the Marshall Space Flight Center that was responsible for the booster absolutely backed them up. Just before the launch, they were challenged by an executive at Marshall Space Flight Center and said, my God, Thaikal, what do you want us to do? Wait on the ground until April? Morton Thaikal talked about it some more, excused their engineers, told their vice president for engineering, you need to take your, your engineering hat off, put your management hat on. A few minutes later, they faxed a one-pager to Marshall that said, Morton Thaikal recommends we go. What was passed on to the executives in Florida, we're all go. No discussion at all about it being too cold, no, dis no discussion at all about the manufacturer being concerned with the performance of those seals, even though there were engineers both at the manufacturer and inside a NASA center who absolutely were opposed to going. How cold was it? Those are icicles hanging off the pad you see in this picture on the day of launch. At the time of launch, it was 36 degrees Fahrenheit outside. The joint seal itself was 28 degrees Fahrenheit. The manufacturer considered 53 degrees to be the coldest temperature they could launch based on performance of those seals in test and on previous flights. 12 of the previous 15 flights, those same seals, the first seal, had leaked. It just hadn't leaked all the way out through the second seal. Three in the, in the previous year, had significant charring on, this, on the last seal, meaning it was within seconds of also burning through, all of which was known by the manufacturer and the engineers and that executive who eventually then said, we're go for launch. Why? Because shuttle costs too much to develop, and we have to get up to at least 12 flights per year, or our cost per flight is too high. The previous year, we had only done nine. This was the year where we have to get to 12. Otherwise, it looks like we lied to Congress, They'll cancel the shuttle program. We won't do all of the things that we went on to do with shuttle. We won't build a space station. In fact, we are at risk of having manned space flight canceled. We can't let that happen. This is our calling. This is too important a uh, thing that we do for humanity. We've got to go. 17 years later, January 16th, 2003, Space Shuttle Columbia takes off. That picture you see of the launch, 81.7 seconds into the launch, that piece of foam, right, oops, that piece of foam, about the size of a piece of loaf of bread, came off the external tank right about there and then flew back and struck the wing. We knew it happened. We told the astronauts, told them that we would probably have to replace some damaged tiles when they landed in Florida at the end of the mission. Two weeks later, on February 1, 2003, that big fireball that forms on the outside of the spaceship when we deorbit leaked in through the front of the wing because we hadn't damaged tiles on the bottom. We had definitely put a, a hole in the front part of the wing, something we did not know for a couple of months after the accident. That hot gas that got into the front of the wing 
essentially destroyed the wing. When the wing came off, Space Shuttle Columbia came apart 40 miles up in the sky going over 10,000 miles an hour with our seven friends sitting in it, and they died right away. 16 minutes before they, la they landed in Florida. You see where two of them were sitting when it happened, as a matter of fact, in the cockpit there. You might not know, two flights before, that same piece of foam, big chunk of it had come off. In that was October of 2002. So we had to talk about that in an engineering discussion before the very next launch, the one before Columbia. The rationale to accept that behavior and keep flying, even though that large piece of foam was coming off, was foam has been coming off for years. It's never been an issue. Hence, it's not an issue. And it can't hit anything. And even if it did, it's only foam. So it's safe to keep flying as is. The rationale was accepted with no technical analysis, no test at all. We flew that flight, and of course we were right because nothing bad happened until the very next launch when something did happen. How did we find ourselves there? Something called faster, better, cheaper. About 10 years before this, after the Challenger accident, where the administrator came to us and said, you know, we're a big NASA, I mean a big government organization, so clearly we're too big, we're too expensive, we can do better. So as we entered the, the, the time of our existence where we were doing the most difficult things we'd ever done in space, building the International Space Station, an International Space Station that, by the way, also now was behind schedule and going over cost, familiar pressure. Now we, are, now we are being constrained on schedule even further in the, in the name of faster, better, cheaper. We have to keep going as fast as we can on the hardest things we're doing with less and less budget. What did it do to us inside the community, inside the manned spaceflight community? We stopped using as much technical rigor to make certain decisions like we did about this phone. It became more and more normal to have to prove that somebody's concerned, that something that we had been doing wasn't safe. And if the judgment of the senior managers was, well, this is, we've been doing this and it's safe, if you can't prove that they're wrong, we're going to keep right on going because we have to. We have to finish building this space station because we have things we want to do later, like going back to the moon and going back to Mars. In fact, those, those executives that were in charge, it was not unusual for their judgment to be the thing that won the decision in spite of whatever the technical data was. Even after this accident, the, the key, key executives were absolutely adamant. In no uncertain terms, that foam did not damage the front of the wing. In fact, the inside NASA community didn't even pursue it as the outside investigation board kept pushing on us. We didn't pursue it until we had test data that proved foam could damage the, the front of the wing, and, and until we recovered data in debris from the, the, the shuttle itself that proved that we had a hole in the front of the wing. And the entire community, even after the accident, was not pursuing it. Those executives, by the way, weren't some nefarious bad guys. Those were heroes, veterans of our, of our business, people who earned the right to be at the, t the head of the table, who we agreed their judgment's more equal than everybody else's. Unless, of course, we are actually ignoring any of the technical detail and just making a judgment based on what we've gotten away with before. What's the common theme in all three of these cases? We had target fixation. A little bit different target fixation in all these cases, all of which amplified schedule and pressure risk, which as executives, no matter what we do, we always are going to have schedule and, and cost risk. In this case, we had other target fixation. And we started ignoring all of those other real problems. Started accepting risks without technical rigor. We didn't make engineering mistakes. Astronauts didn't make a mistake flying. Mission control didn't make a mistake. The engineers did a good job putting the spacecraft together. Even in the Apollo 1 case, all of those other problems we fixed, aside from that fire, those things would have snuck up on us because we were racing and we were going to launch. What makes the difference for us? Leadership values and culture. By the way, the other thing that's common about all three of these cases, those people that trust us with their lives died. The choice that we have as, as leaders is to remember that those deliberate values, that culture that make us so good at what we do when we're flying the rocket, we have to be even more deliberate as managers, as executives, to make sure that we don't let other things now creep in. Real things that we have to deal with as managers, but as they creep in and we have to deal with them, make sure they don't push out the other things that we also have to manage to keep the rocket from blowing up, or to make sure that our people can still pull off miracles, whether you fly rockets or whatever your business is. Deliberate values, deliberately stewarded culture. That's what makes a difference for us. Thank you.